Who you don't take in your rookie drafts is just as important as who you do take. Here are the five players I'm making sure all rookie big board faithful know to avoid at cost. This is the time of year it is easy to get caught up in hype. It's easy to get caught up in narratives about some of the more trendy, some of the more popular, the, the quick rising players. So I have five players who pre-draft, I'm very confident I'm going to have 0% exposure to in my rookie drafts. Now, I'm going to go through each of these five players, and I want you to understand, I don't think these are all bad players, but it's all about understanding the cost of that player. The rookie big board has helped folks miss on some pretty big uh, whiffs in the past. We were off Quinton Johnston. We were uh, notoriously anti Jalen Rager until that became a popular take. We told you a full fade on Rashad Bateman never got on that train. And even some of the more popular guys like Kendra Miller, Jalen Tolbert. We're going to start here with Texas running back Jonathan Brooks. And yes, it does hurt me to start here. You can let me know in the comments light me up for it. I know it's not a popular take, but folks, we're in a tough spot with Jonathan Brooks. You have a player who waited his turn behind two great running backs in Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson. He gets a crack at the Texas backfield after beating out true freshman running back CJ Baxter, who he originally lost the job to. And when we saw that tape, it is good tape. I want to emphasize that. I think he's explosive. I think he shows good lateral agility. I think Brooks displays pretty good vision. He's a nice extension of the passing game. My big thing with Jonathan Brooks is that we are willing to forego this significant knee injury much too quickly. I've noticed in the discourse, in the rookie mock drafts that I've been doing, Jonathan Brooks is still going at a mid-second round value, and folks, that's just too much for him. My favorite traits on tape for Jonathan Brooks, the reasons I get excited for him, it's his explosiveness, his ability to pop off the line of scrimmage and get into that second level of the field, and it's his lateral agility. It's his ability to get in and through cuts with ease and confidence. It's his ability to jump step, sidestep defenders, be elusive in tight space. And those things will come back to Jonathan Brooks, but we can't realistically expect it to come back and see that type of confidence in his knee, that type of explosiveness in his running style, uh, even if he does get back on the field for week one, which I do not expect. I know he is saying that. His camp is saying that he'll be ready for week one. Of course, folks, he's trying to improve his draft stock. Now, only NFL teams really know what those medicals look like, but I fully expect Jonathan Brooks to start the 2024 season on the pup list the physically unable to perform designation i expect that will carry over possibly into that six week ir and here's the bottom line jonathan brooks can still be an absolutely fantastic running back he could have a strong career in the nfl but you have to understand if you're drafting him you have to bake in the fact that his value will plummet when he doesn't produce right away. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's justified, but we've seen it year over year. Dynasty fantasy football managers, they are not patient. They forget fast. And so you're going to be left in a position where you will absolutely need Jonathan Brooks to have a smash sophomore campaign, or he's always going to be one of those middling value rotational running backs that you're going to, you know, maybe have in your flex, flex spot and you're not going to be able to get off of your roster. He's currently my running back eight, you know, running backs three through 11 on the rookie big board are really tight for me. But at cost right now, which I expect to be mid-second round pick, it's just too much for Jonathan Brooks. And like I said, I don't like it any more than you do. The next guy up here is super popular, so I'm just going to keep digging myself a hole. But I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to take the unpopular take to give some sound fantasy football advice. And I'm going to go ahead and rain on the Malachi Corley parade a little bit. Now, the rookie big board is done very well over the last few years, fading what I would call manufactured production, right? Some of these guys that have been very popular for their box score and their stats over the last couple of years, it's easy for me to project that that's not going to translate to the next level. Think of Rondale Moore, folks. Think of Kadarius Toney, right? Malachi Corley saw a lot of forced targets, plays drawn up specifically for him. 
I don't care whether he's drafted on day two or day three. You could tell me that he was drafted on day one like Kadarius Tony. It's not going to matter because these rookies don't get manufactured targets at the NFL level. It just does not work like that. And so Malachi Corley, to be able to perform with his low A dot, with, with, with relying on yards after catch ability, you're going to need to be able to project 90 a hundred targets to be able to make that work. It's just not a realistic spot to project for even a day two rookie wide receiver. So that draft capital folks, it can't save him. And as good process in general, yards after catch is the lowest weight in my wide receiver trait formula here. It, when I, when I get that tape grade out, I want to emphasize this folks. There is one Debo Samuel. All right. He's already in the league plays for the San Francisco 49ers. You can say that Malachi Corley reminds you of Debo Samuel, but he is not Debo Samuel. You should not draft him expecting to get Debo Samuel type production. And it's a really strong wide receiver class. You just have better options in the mid to late third round, which is where I expect Mar Malachi Corley to go. Again, it's not so much the player. I like him on my NFL team. I just don't necessarily want Malachi Corley on my fantasy football team. All right, next up here, we're going to go to the quarterback position. This should be no surprise. I am a full fade, 0% exposure, zero interest in Michael Penix Jr., the quarterback out of Washington. The biggest concern I have for, for Michael Penix Jr., I'm not even going to lead here with the four season-ending injuries. I'm not even going to lead with those two knee injuries, those two upper body injuries, one to the throwing shoulder. I'm not even going to lead with the fact that he's a statue in the pocket. I'm going to lead with the fact that his accuracy, folks, is overstated. Yes, you pull up the box score. It looks good. Go break down the tape for Michael Penix Jr. He's throwing behind his receivers. He's missing his receivers. I improved my tape evaluations of Roma Dunze and Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk after watching Michael Penix. I had to go back and reevaluate all three wide receivers because it became abundantly clear how much those wide receivers were doing. Those highlight reel catches we love of Roma Dunze, Folks, there's a reason he had to make so many highlight reel catches. He was adjusting for a lot of off-target passes. So I'm by no means sitting here and trying to slander Michael Penix and say that you know he's the least accurate quarterback in the class, but we shouldn't be heading into the draft with this idea that he is a super accurate quarterback. Now let's get to the fantasy projection. And remember, this is all how do we translate real actual fantasy production? Michael Penix Jr., I know he ran a 4 5 5 40 time. It doesn't matter, folks. He's not going to be running. He's not going to be mobile in the NFL. The reason, you know, if you go back, if you've been watching Michael Penix for a few years like I have, you go back to his Indiana tape. It wasn't that he couldn't run. That mobility was a big piece of his Indiana tape. So I wasn't surprised when he put up that 40 time. The reason he stopped running in Washington was because they needed to keep him healthy. He kept getting injured. So they limited him to the pocket. Now, so it's not realistic to project, you know, more than maybe 125 rushing yards and maybe one or two rushing touchdowns for Michael Penix, even if he is drafted to be a starter, which I do think is a reach at this point in time. But let's say he is a starter. Let's say he's drafted by Las Vegas with what pick 13 there. I don't think it's going to happen, but let's just put him in the best situation possible. Then in order to get a quarterback who has no real rushing production in order to put into my spreadsheet and get them to be a QB1. Folks, we're looking at over 4,000 passing yards. We're looking at over 32 passing touchdowns. We got to have limited interceptions there. So we got to get him in a high volume offense and we've got to get him throwing the ball immediately at a high level. It's not realistic. I think the absolute best case scenario for Michael Penix Jr. is Kirk Cousins. And I'm talking first round draft capital. I'm talking he hits the field right away. I'm talking that he just absolutely lights it up. I think it's Kirk Cousins, who's currently QB 14 in my 2024 seasonal projections. That's not what it's not. That's not worth the risk that you're putting into it. The reward doesn't equal the risk with Michael Penix. I think right now he's going for a mid second round pick. If he gets that first round draft capital, he's probably going to end up with back of the first round ADP, which I would avoid at all costs. I'm talking about in super flex leagues, of course. I think I'm the lowest on Michael Penix. I have him QB eight in my rankings right now. 
I just don't see it with him. It's going to be a full fade with me. Folks, I got to tell you, I took this full fade concept from something that I entered into the 2024 Rookie Big Board Rookie Guide. You'll see here that on the Rookie Guide, there's a full player profile. There's the tape breakdown, strengths, weaknesses, path to success, path to bust. And of course, my full tape evaluation of these guys. But I also put at the end actionable, tangible advice here, just like you can see on the Michael Penix profile. I give my last word and I tell you how much exposure I'm going to have. So that's what I took this concept from. If you want to check out the rookie guide along with the full rookie big board rankings, along with a super active discord, you can head on over to patreon.com slash rookie big board. The link will be in the episode description and you're going to get an updated version of this rookie guide the Sunday after the NFL draft. You're going to get updated 2024 seasonal projections with the 2024 rookie class into it the Sunday after the NFL draft. And you're going to get actionable, quick advice for all your rookie drafts in the Discord. We use the On The Clock channel uh, to help make sure all of our rookie big board patrons know who to fade and who to draft. But speaking of who to fade here, let's get back to it. We're going to go back to the running back position. Position. And I'm going to throw out a name here who's a running back one for a lot of folks and a lot of folks who I respect. I'm not knocking their opinions at all, but it just don't see it. And that's going to be Trey Benson, the running back out of Florida State. I'm not paying for Trey Benson. Yes, there's good strength. Yes. If you, if you plug him in, you know, you look at some of those PFF stats, you look at some of that, those athletic numbers, there's a reasons to get excited about Trey Benson. And I got to tell you, folks, there's only one main red flag for me, but it is the reddest of the flags. It's my most weighted aspect of my film review. It's his vision. Trey Benson struggles to see the field. He was running behind a good offensive line at Florida State, an experienced veteran offensive line at Florida State. The amount of times that he missed cutback lanes, he failed to see space. I mean, folks, you can see plenty of examples of him running right into the back of his own offensive lineman. It's not worth the reach. He's going to be at the cheapest in early second round of value here. At the turn of the second round, folks, you're still going to have really good wide receivers. This is a range like guys like Xavier Worthy may be falling. Guys like Ladd McConkey may be falling. I would much rather invest in one of those wide receivers than I would in Trey Benson just because he may be the highest ADP for the running back position, right? We see this all the time. Every single year, we force up running backs because we're scared of that, that positional scarcity, and then we reach. The number one rule of the rookie big board here is you uh, draft for value, you trade for need. Don't take Trey Benson just because you want to take a running back. The vision is just too risky. All right, I have one more player for you here. Let's go ahead and get into, we're going to go back to Texas. We're going to talk about wide receiver A.D. Mitchell. This one's tough for me. It really is. Because when you watch Mitchell's tape, you get really excited, but the production was just so inconsistent. It was inconsistent in Georgia, and you can excuse that away because the Georgia offense is not friendly uh, to wide receivers especially, but he transfers to Texas. There's highs, there's lows. You know, it's just difficult for me. And when I'm always thinking forward, folks, I'm always thinking about how do I plug this guy into a spreadsheet? How do I, what's that output, right? What's that fantasy production? What's the real actionable insight that I can give? And for A.D. Mitchell, it's going to be tough for me to project 80 plus targets for him in an offense. It really is. Even if he is drafted in the first round, which at this point I fully expect back into the first round, he could land with Buffalo. He could land with Kansas City. He could land. Uh, with Dallas. There's a lot of exciting offenses he could land in. And I think at that point, his price is just going to be sky high. He's going to go 108, 109, you know, back into the first round is probably the lowest Adonai Mitchell will go. And I just think that draft capital is going to eliminate any value for him. So when you're looking at the right guys to draft and fade, it's not always about who you like versus who you don't like. It's who you like at that price. If I can get a Donnie Mitchell in the mid to late second round, 
I'm absolutely going to be adding him on my team for that upside. But that's heavy risk here in the back end of the first round. If you're drafting that 108, 109, 110, that means you're a fringe championship team. You need to be able to draft a guy that you can really go all in on. Guys like Xavier Worthy, guys like Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, could be at the back end of the first round. I want to go for those types of players who also have upside but with a little bit more floor before I go for a guy like Adane Mitchell. So those are the five guys that I am fading. I am out on. Like I said, drop a comment. Let me know. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on if there's somebody you're fading who I didn't mention in the video. Ask any rookie question. I love to have that back and forth discourse. And like I mentioned, if you want to get in on the rookie guide, in on the rookie big board discord, the rookie rankings, a ton of great content available for just $5 a month over at patreon.com slash rookie big board. And if you get that annual sub, it's going to be 15% off. Thanks for watching, everybody.